Howdy Tubes, welcome back to the Zach Life. I realize it's kind of echoing here, we're in my office. I don't know if y'all remember this place, but this is actually where I shot all the paint on the black panels that's on the motorhome. And it's been just pretty well useless. Uh, it's been a mess and everything's covered in paint. Anyway, I finally got five gallons of lacquer thinner. And, uh, and actually all the, uh, all, all the paint more or less come off everything. Anyway, I can, hear, I can tell it's echoey. I hope you can hear me good enough. The air conditioner is really noisy in here. Uh, seems like that's a recurring theme around here. But anyway, on to what this video is about. So I bought a great big expensive power inverter. And I'd like to make this video all about these power inverters. I'd like to talk about the different kinds. Um, a lot of times the, the similarities in the names don't mean they work the same. They're sort of, uh, well, you know, there's this one. This is called a low frequency inverter. We're gonna take it apart and see why it's called that. Uh, low frequency pure sign inverter specifically. Uh, there's high frequency pure sine inverters, uh, modified sine wave inverters, and we're going to talk about even modified sine wave converters, why they're not all, all created equal. Uh, there are definitely places for all of them. So uh, this, this came from uh, Amazon, from a third party seller, and I have a feeling that this is a refurbished unit. It's supposed to be new, it's got a manufacturer date on it of uh, 11, 19, 18, so it's three years old. And it's got a great big old dent. It's been, it's been dropped really hard. Uh, it was 20, 2,500 bucks, I don't remember exactly. Anyway, it's a 5,000 watt, 24 volt converter. So like everything, when you buy something cool, the first thing you gotta do is take it apart. So let's pull it apart and see what it looks like. You know, all those screws are all loose. I, I kind of, I, I, I really have a feeling this was a, a sent back or refurbished or something. It also can come, and it's coming in literature, and like the screws that are supposed to be on the battery post are gone. Who knows, you pay full price for it. You know, that's how stuff goes. If you need to make a decision on, on a part, you know, if you need this thing or if you need that thing, if you need a travel trailer, if you need a motorhome, you don't need to ask someone, do I need this or do I need that? You need enough information that you can back up and look at your situation and come up with your own answer. And that's what I'm gonna try to do today with these inverters. I like to know things and I like for other people to know things. And I'd like to explain how these things work um, the differences in them and in knowing the differences you can then make a decision on what you need or what you don't need so anyway let's buzz down here and zoom in and uh, and take a look at this thing so uh, I need to start off by saying I think this thing weighs about uh, about a hundred pounds and like I'm, I'm not kidding when I say that it's it's as heavy as a sack of concrete. It's got this big transformer, a bunch of, a bunch of steel here. But I want to very briefly try to explain uh, sort of how this works, and then we'll back up and get a better understanding of, of how it does what I'm fixing to try to explain to you. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, uh, but, the, but the logistics of how it does it is kind of complicated. So very briefly, you've got uh, actually three heat sinks here. There's one, there's two, you can see they're split, and then there's basically on the other side, there's there's it's all one piece, but it looks the same. Down here you've got transistors, these are called MOSFETs, metal oxide field effect transistor, or something like that. I always get that mixed up. Metal ox metal oxide field effect transistor. Anyway, these are basically used as switches. Okay? These switches, you can see there's there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in this chunk of heat sink, eight in that chunk of heat sink, 16 over here. 
Now, the heat sink on this side is, is tied to the negative DC in, okay? Now these, how I many did I say the word? Two, four, six, eight. These eight MOSFETs output is connected to these eight MOSFET outputs and these to these, okay? There's a positive bus that comes from the battery that feeds into the bottom source of these switches. Okay, so you've got the output that goes to the transformer. There's, you know, these two are basically the same wire. They just, the, the, the current is so big they use two, two sets of wires. Uh, you've got output and output. So anyway, how this works is you turn on this set of switches and the opposite corner set of switches, these eight and these eight, and that would cause this to be negative, this to be positive. If you flip-flop and you turn on these switches and these switches, that would make this positive and this negative, okay? That's all you need to know. These switches control the negative, these switches control the positive, and the output of the two are connected underneath and then brought up and tied into this heat sink. This chunk here is just control circuitry. This, this is what tells them to turn off and on. And, uh, and then it's brought back into this transformer. So we've got basically 24 volts DC coming in. Uh, these are alternating switches at 60 times per second or actually much faster than that, we'll learn in a minute. And, uh, and that AC output of 24 volts goes into the transformer and this transformer steps it up to 120 or 240 or, or whatever you need. In this case, it's 120. So the first thing we need to talk about is which way does electricity actually flow? The actual electron flow from electricity actually flows from the negative through the load to the positive. So we got a battery a resistor here, which is just uh, just a makeshift load, a light, whatever have you. Uh, the electrons actually flow from the negative to the positive. All electrical schematics and all electronic schematics, when you look at resistors, you talk well not necessarily resistors, but um, diodes, um, uh, transistors, all kinds of electronic schematics use what's called a conventional current flow. And this, in, in the sense of the electronics, and the design of the electronics, electricity flows from positive to negative. Now this is contrary to the actual path electricity takes, but it's called conventional current flow, okay? That's what we're going to use is conventional current flow. When I say the electricity travels from the positive to the negative, know that that's not actually the way the electrons move, but as far as the schematics go and, and just the general uh, you know, communication of electronic components, you use conventional current flow. Current flows from positive, negative, negative. So we need to talk about transistors and the different kinds. So there's two main kinds of transistors and that's bipolar junction transistors and there is FETs or field effect transistors. Uh, the bipolar junction transistor was the original transistor. This is the one that was made back in Bell Laboratories in 1940 or whatever it was. I don't know exactly when. Way back in the day. Uh, the, the FETs are sort of a newer transistor. I think they were actually invented way back when, but you, I, I don't think they really were came into existence uh, as far as common usage until about 20 years ago. Uh, a lot of the really high-powered uh, electronics like car amplifiers, power inverters, that kind of stuff, uh, the MOSFETs being, being ad uh, adopted are really what made some of these possible. It made you know really really large amplifiers smaller. Uh, they just they handle the high power better. So right here we're looking at a typical bipolar transistor, NPN transistor. Uh, we've got a power supply here. The emitter would be connected to the negative. Uh, the positive comes up, goes to the uh, you know powers the positive side of your load. This could be a speaker. This could be a light, a motor. You know whatever. And, uh, and the other side of your load comes into the collector. Now the base here would be connected to the ground, to the negative, excuse me. It's not a ground, it's a negative. Uh, through whatever device you want to control it with, whether it be a microphone or a switch or a potentiometer, what have you. Now when you hook these together, this will basically turn this on and turn your, and turn your, your, your load on. 
Now, the, the, the difference you need to grasp in this in a, in, a, in a MOSFET is that some of the power that comes from your, your load actually travels from the base to the ground. These can have like a 100 to 1. So if this pulls one amp, you know, if you've got one amp load here, uh, you would have 990 milliamps here and 10 milliamps from your base here. That's the important difference is, is that some of your load actually passes through your control device. Now this works excellent as a small, low powered amplifier, something like a preamp, whatever. That's, that's the kind of transistor that you probably would want to use. Uh, the problem with that kind of transistor is, is when you have very, very high power devices, much like this power inverter, where you've got thousands of watts, you know, if you've got a 100 to 1 ratio uh, transistor, you still end up with a significant amount of power to power your transistor. And of course, in today's electronics, the smaller the, the drive power and stuff is better. So that's where the metal oxide field effect transistor comes in, the MOSFET. So here is a metal oxide field effect transistor, a MOSFET. Uh, it's hooked up like a bipolar transistor, but it works and is controlled much differently. So you've got a, the negative side of your power supply, your battery here, is hooked to the source. The positive goes to your load, and the other side of your load comes back to the drain. Now the gate, to turn this kind of transistor on, you would hook the gate to a voltage that's, that's positive reference to the source. So this is tied to the source, you know, say five volts or whatever. To turn it off, you would bring the gate voltage back to the source voltage. You would hook it back to the source, hook it to the negative side of this battery, take it back to zero volts. The difference in this is, is your gate acts somewhat like a capacitor, and we'll explain that in a minute, but the power there's no leakage back to the to this circuit. I mean, theoretically, there there is an extremely small amount, but but the there isn't any power supplied to the gate that ends up in this circuit. These are basically two different circuits. This one works much more like a relay than than the uh, than a typical bipolar transistor. So let's take a little bit of equipment, and I'd like to demonstrate how a MOSFET works and how you control it. So here's my power supply. I'm going to short these together and adjust my current. Uh, this is current limited to about four tenths of an amp. And the voltage here at about 13 volts. And so this light that was supposed to go on the RV that didn't make it on the RV is going to be, is going to be our load. Uh, the center pin would be the source, that's the source from our power supply. The one to the right will be the will be the drain. Then I get these to stay there without shorting out. Okay, so this, this wire here would be your signal wire or what's coming from whatever's controlling it. And I would this like to be able to show how sensitive these MOSFETs are. So if I touch this, I'm touching the, 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 the drain, and I touch the positive signal, it will actually draw enough current through me or enough voltage through me to turn on the FET. If I touch the ground, it goes off. So this power supply has, is, a, is not a grounded power supply. The negative side is not hooked to earth. It's a floating positive and floating negative. There's nothing tied to the earth. There's nothing tied to the ground. There's nothing electrically hooked back to the plug-in. Uh, both the positive and the negative are floating. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I think I started to, I don't know if I did, the control of these, the gate, acts a lot like a capacitor. 
Now a capacitor is like a battery in that you can charge it and discharge it, but it has a very controlled and a very uh, exact amount of, of power that it holds and releases. The, the MOSFET gate is a like a capacitor in that when you charge it up and you turn it on or discharge it, it tends to stay in the state that you leave it. So if we turn it on, it tends to stay on. And if you, you know, take it to the ground, if you take it to zero, it tends to stay at zero. What's really cool to me about this is when this is on the, in the on state, there is a, a lack of electrons. The, the, the electrons, there's not enough, I'm not gonna get into, I don't really understand exactly the theory of how these work but there's holes in some of the semiconductor and there's not enough electrons to fill the holes. Anyway, blah, 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 kind of lost me there too. The, the, there's a lack of electrons. Now electrons are what give you a shock, like you rub your feet across the carpet. And so right now, since I'm tired of this, I have a lack of electrons. And if I touch something like the table, I'll actually absorb electrons. And if you saw there, it actually turned the MOSFET down because I absorbed some some uh, electrons from the MOSFET. Now, if you take your hand and run it on something like trying to make static, you can actually sort of turn the MOSFET on just by picking static up by running your hand on something. If you go the other way, it actually turns it off. I don't exactly understand static and how that works, but I really think that's uh, that's cool. Anyway, I just wanted to show that the amount of, of, of electrical power used to turn a MOSFET off and on is about as close to zero as you can get something that's not theoretical and it still be zero. You know, it's an extremely, extremely minute amount of current. So I want to bring you back over here to this thing and show you when we got a little bit more understanding of how the MOSFET works or how the switches it works. And, and kind of show you a schematic of the high power load that's going on here. Now we've got four sets. You know, you saw, you know, there's eight MOSFETs here, eight, FET, eight FETs here, and you can't see there's also eight here and eight here. There's four groups, and we're showing them as four switches. These would be manual push button switches. So anyway, what this thing is doing is basically turning on these eight and these eight FETs and it clicks these switches down so that the positive goes through this way, the negative goes through this way, and then it alternates them. Click, 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 click. That's the basic form of where the DC to AC is generated here. Now it gets more complicated than that. We're going to get back to that in just a minute. So we need to discuss transformers. What transformers can do, what they can't do. I'm fixing to describe this to you in a way that's, that's incorrect and, and in doing that it, it allows you to have a sort of a simple understanding of what they can do and what they can't do, why they can do it and why they can't, uh, but it's not technically correct, it's not exactly how they work, but it, it gives you the, exactly the correct understanding of what they can do uh, without getting in, you know, to the magnetic decay and, and you know, core supersaturation stuff, but anyway, a transformer is two sets of coils that's wrapped around an iron core. I've actually got another transformer here, and this gives a really good view of an iron core here, and you've got two sets of windings. You've got a low voltage winding that's a big, heavy, high current wire with not near as many turns, and then you've got a low current, high voltage, very fine wire right in here that you can see. The, re the relationship between the number of turns on this winding and this winding gives you the relationship between the voltage. So if this has got 10 turns and this has got 100, you would have a voltage of, you know, 10 times, 12 to 120. So back to what I'm fixing to explain that's incorrect. This is just a kind of simple layman's term. It's really easy to understand. It's the best way to make do it. A transformer has a limited ability to move power through its two sets of windings. And this is limited by the size of the core. If, if, a, if, if magnetism had a, had a volume unit, 
you could describe the volume unit of the iron core of that transformer. Anyway, once a transformer's iron core gets up to its maximum amplitude of magnetism, when it's not increasing in magnetism anymore, the transformer is no longer transforming power because it has to be increasing or decreasing in magnetism to induce a voltage in the secondary windings of the transformer. That probably sounds kind of, kind of confusing, but I want you to understand if you hook a DC load or DC power supply up to the primary of a winding of a transformer, you'll actually get an output spike. But quickly that spike will go to zero because the core of the transformer becomes super saturated and there's no more change in magnetism in the core. If you hook DC into the primary side of the transformer, you'll get a spike, but the spike quickly goes away and goes to zero. Now, this thing is called a low frequency inverter, and the reason for it being called that is that the, the switching of this power supply, excuse me, the switching of the MOSFETs is done at 60 hertz, and that goes into a transformer, and this transformer is also at 60 hertz. That's considered low frequency, that's line frequency. So we've gone over a low frequency inverter. Uh, this is the schematic, this is the, not the control circuitry, but just the main switching power supply part, the, the heavy, heavy duty part. So let's talk about high frequency inverters. So I've got an overlay here. It's like this. Now you'll notice that these are uh, quite similar and that we've got the same set of MOSFETs with a 24 volt input. Of course, this could be 12 or, or whatever. Now the same switching set of MOSFETs that energize a transformer. This transformer and then energizes the secondary windings, goes to a set of diodes, rectifies this back to DC, and then sort of this th same thing starts over. Now let's back up and make more sense out of this. Uh, the reason that they do this is these MOSFETs, instead of switching at 60 hertz, 60 pounds per second, uh, they'll actually switch them at uh, maybe around 10,000 times per second, maybe even faster than that. I would say I would say around five to 10,000 times per second is probably common in most in most big power supplies like this. So that high frequency lets you take that big giant transformer, all that power that's going through that big giant transformer and shrink that transformer down to a little bitty, you know, maybe even, maybe even this big if you get up to the 50,000 hertz or so, you know, a hundredth of the size. And the reason for this is there's less windings, there's less magnetic holding ability of the, of the iron core, but since you're switching the way that electricity travels at a much higher rate, you don't have to have nearly as large of an iron core. You don't have to have nearly as many turns on the transformer. Uh, your transformer can, can shrink to extremely small size. This schematic looks a lot more complicated, and it is more complicated. There's more parts here, uh, but the advantage is instead of having to have a huge transformer, you now shrink that transformer down to something that maybe, you know, maybe only, uh, you know, the size of a coffee cup or smaller, even in an inverter this, this large. So when we talk about rectification or rectifying this high frequency AC back to DC, uh, what we're talking about is a diode or a rectifier. A diode is basically a check valve and it only allows electricity to travel one way. And so when you've got this high frequency AC going back and forth, it, it, it opens and shuts these gates, if you will, and only lets the, the power flow in one direction and takes that AC and turns it back into a, a choppy DC. Now that DC is now ran through a capacitor. And as I said at the beginning, a capacitor is something that stores electricity. And that capacitor smooths out the high frequency AC ripple into a good, smooth, uh, couple hundred volt uh, DC. These rectifiers are like check valves. The power will travel through them in the positive direction towards the arrows. So you can see, regardless of which way the power is trying to turn, uh, you'll always have, this one will always be positive, this one will always be negative. This charges up this capacitor. Now we sort of have a, a same thing up here. You've got a capacitor power supply of around 200 volts. 
uh, 200 volts of fully charged batteries. <clears throat> and this, uh, you've got a, a set of MOSFETs here and you'll switch MOSFETs at 60 hertz to take this high voltage DC and change it to high voltage AC. Pure sine wave versus modified sine wave inverter. What's the difference? Uh, you probably know the difference. You've probably seen the, uh, the modified sine wave that kind of looks squared off uh, versus a real sine wave. I've got some drawn over here. You'll have to excuse my artisticness because that is not something I'm very good at. But let's take a look at it. So down here we've got a, a pure sine wave. This sine wave would be what you would see on a scope if you looked at the power coming in from the grid. Interestingly, I hear often people talking about uh, inverter generators, talking about how an inverter generator has got a pure, more pure sine wave, and this is completely false. Uh, it is a cheap rigor old generator that you buy will have a, a less total harmonic distortion by far than a, uh, a pure sine wave inverter generator. Now that's not to say that they're not as good. I mean, they'll run anything you want to run. But I hear people say, you need to buy an inverter generator because they put out cleaner energy, cleaner power, and that's completely false. A modified sine wave inverter is supposed to output, I uh, screwed up right here, don't look at the first part, it's supposed to output a, a wave that looks something like this. And this is supposed to mimic a sine wave in that you've got negative on, positive on, negative on, positive on, with times of zero in between. It's supposed to simulate a sine wave. It's a modified sine wave. Now something you need to know, something you need to consider is that the actual voltage on 120 volts, the actual peak voltage is about, you know, from, from the top point down to here is about 170 volts. You know, this would be positive, you know, from here to here would be 100, 170 negative. The way you come up with 120 volts AC, the, the way that's measured is in RMS, root mean squared. That basically means the average of the voltage if you don't average in the negatives. Uh, the squaring, the square root of something squared takes the negative away. It's basically the average of the voltage is 120. Obviously, since it goes to zero, it's gotta be higher at some point. So anyway, that's where this DC voltage this DC bus of 160 to 200 volts comes in. In a high frequency inverter, the first step in the set of MOSFETs, one through the little bitty transformer and then back to the rectifiers, boosts that voltage. That voltage boost is not something that the inverter can control. It only steps it up a certain percentage. If it's a, a 12 volt inverter, 12 volt to 120, and you're trying to get 200 volts DC in your, in your DC bus, you know, that's a step up of I can't do the math in my head, you know, what, 12 or 13 times, something like that. Anyway, the point I'm making is, is the voltage that's in that DC bus is directly relational to the input voltage. The inverter can't change that. So at 14 volts, uh, you might have 200 volts DC in this bus, but, you know, if your battery starts going dead, you get down to say 11 volts, the voltage will fall in that bus to, you know, 130 volts or whatever. I'm making numbers up, but it gives you an idea. Now this modified sine wave here is what a modified sine wave is supposed to look like. And how this inverter controls the actual AC output, the actual AC voltage that you, may, you read with a, with a meter is by how wide or how long this, uh, this power pulse has stayed on. So the height of this power pulse is directly relational to the input voltage to your inverter. So if your battery voltage falls from 14 volts to 10 volts, the voltage here, you know, this is, this is just being switched by a set of switches from this, from this faster, from this bus, this peak voltage will come down. This peak voltage will always be the same as this DC voltage. I hope that makes sense. It sounds confusing to me trying to say it. Anyway, the way the inverter controls output voltage is by how wide or how long this wave is on. And so as this voltage falls, the inverter must make this, this wave wider to, uh, to have its lower voltage be on longer 
so that the root mean squared average is 120 volts. The problem with this is, is after this gets much wider, you actually end up with a square wave. A square wave is detrimental to any kind of inductive equipment. Uh, this is this is anything that's not resistive, anything like an incandescent light, anything not like an incandescent light bulb, anything like not like a heater. Uh, this is transformers, power supplies, electric motors, anything that creates a magnet, anything that goes to a transformer, anything that, that goes to a coil of wire it is inductive. And so what an inductor does is an inductor or a choke tries to maintain current flow. And so when you hook power up to a choke or you hook power up to the windings in a motor or the transformer in a, in a, in a force of light, uh, when you hook power up to it, the inductor actually works sort of like a flywheel and then it, 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 it keeps power from flowing through there for a little while. It has to sort of accelerate the power. It takes a, an amount of time before the current actually gets up to full flow. Then when you turn the power off to it, it tries to push energy, push, electro, push electrons uh, through the gap that you just created and turning it off and it creates a voltage spike. Uh, this is the same way a coil works on a car. You've got a, you know, the coil on an old style car with points has got, is basically a transformer. You've got a low voltage and a high voltage. In the low voltage, you pull a current through it with the points closed, and when you open the points, that voltage spike, the magnetic field collapses, that inductor tries to push power through that, through that open points, and that creates a voltage spike, several hundred volts across the points, and then that travels through the transformer and you get a, a spark. But anyway, the modified, or excuse me, the square wave in something inductive is what's so detrimental and makes so much heat because you're taking that, that, that choke or that inductor or whatever that's, that's having power pushed through it, instead of turning it off and letting it naturally go back to, to zero volts, you're reversing the direction. You're having a high current spike inside the windings of that, of that inductor, transformer, whatever, whatever, that cold wire and that's what produces a lot of extra heat. I'm not saying that a modified sine wave is as good as a pure sine wave, but in a lot of ways, I think that the problems people run across the modified sine is not so much the, uh, the sine wave itself, it's running the inverters on low voltage that creates a square wave. Um, I, I wanna say that again, I'm not saying that modified sine waves is good and it does cause problems, but I think that a lot of the problems are exaggerated by low voltage which is something that you have to deal with. This isn't just saying, oh, I'm just going to keep my batteries charged up. But anyway, that's just a consideration. Now let's talk about the pure sine wave and how it creates. So here is a, another uh, picture of a sine wave. And this is how a pure sine inverter creates or mimics a pure sine wave. Now this applies for both a low frequency inverter and a high frequency inverter, uh, you would just control these pulses with either these set of MOSFETs or on a low frequency, just your single set of MOSFETs. But anyway, it, it stages, this, this voltage is the same way. Uh, this peak voltage is equal to your DC bus, you know, or, uh, or, your, or your battery voltage. If it's low frequency, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have all this. But this peak voltage is, is, is equal to your bus voltage, and it's the same way. If your batteries are low, this voltage will fall, and the inverter will make wider each of these little power pulses. Now, what this does that a modified sine wave doesn't is when you have something that's inductive, this isn't a pure sine wave, but it gives it impulses. So this, this type of sine wave, if you would, I, I still would call it sort of a modified sine wave, but anyway, it works much, much better. If you remember talking about the inductor sort of like a flywheel. Instead of just turning the power onto the full bore, trying to, trying to make it go, and then turning it off, it bumps it. And also, you know, I've got this drawn sort of in, 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 in like five pulses, and probably it's got more than that, you know, probably 20. And so that inductor, when you start powering up the transformer, you know, instead of just turning the power on, you get a, you know, bump, 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 and then you get a full-blown, 
you know, full power there for, you know, a few thousandths of a second, and then it pulls it back, and you get a bump, 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 you know, and then and then it's at zero. And so anyway, it gives that in that inductance uh, power to sort of wind back to zero, get back to to no current, no voltage, and then it starts the you know the wave on the other side. Looking at that, I know it doesn't look that good. You look at it on a scope, it doesn't look that great. You go through a transformer, you go through a couple inductors, some caps. Uh, it does filter this out and, and, and make this look smoother. Uh, but in my experience, or my understanding, I shouldn't say experience, in my understanding, that is, uh, it works great. A, a sine wave like that uh, drives electric motors extremely well. By the way, a VFD, is basically this exact same thing. A, a VFD is basically this, you know, a, a, a set of uh, set of rectifiers, set of diodes, a bus bar, and then and then MOSFETs that, that the controller control the motor. It puts out a a sine wave like this. Obviously, the difference in a VFD is you can control the uh, the amplitude of it and the and the frequency of it. So we discussed high frequency, modified sine wave, pure sine wave. What's the advantage to a low frequency, pure sine wave inverter? Now, in all reality, you could have a low frequency, modified sine wave inverter, but no company that builds a couple thousand dollar inverter is going to not put a sophisticated enough controller in it to make it pure sine, okay? It could technically exist, but, but they don't for that reason. So what's the advantage of a low frequency versus a high frequency? Obviously the advantage to, to a high frequency inverter is that the components are small. It's lightweight, it doesn't weigh as much, it doesn't produce as much heat, and it actually is more efficient. Believe it or not, going through all these different sets of controls, going from DC to AC to DC back to AC, is actually more efficient than trying to push all that power through that big giant transformer. That transformer eats up, eats up a significant amount of power. In fact, we'll just power this thing up here in a minute and uh, actually see what the, what the standby usage of it is. But anyway, the advantage is to a low frequency inverter. MOSFETs are extremely cheap. And this, this inverter has got a, so it's a 5,000 watt, it's a 6,000 watt inverter actually. It's a 6,000 watt inverter and it's supposed to be able to output 18,000 watts for 20 seconds, okay? A high frequency inverter won't be able to do anything remotely like that. And the reason is, is when they build a high frequency inverter, all of these components, all these MOSFETs, this little transformer, the rectifiers, the other set of MOSFETs, are all spec to how much power is going to be moved through the, trans through the power inverter. You know, if it's a so I did a poor job explaining this, so I'm gonna try again. The, uh, the components in a high frequency inverter don't have the ability to handle an overload. If you built the inverter robust enough to handle an overload, ultimately the only thing you have done is built a higher capacity in inverter. And this is how the inverter would be marketed. It would just simply be marketed as a larger inverter. The, uh, the other problem here is that the, the output MOSFETs that control uh, the actual output frequency between uh, the high frequency DC bus capacitor and the actual output are small. And so if you look at the MOSFETs that's on the, uh, the other the inverter that's in here, the low frequency, uh, the output FETs may only be a single one of those instead of 16 or, or actually it would be four instead of 16. And the, the problem is, is with that capacitor and these MOSFETs, if you, if you hook a high current load up to it, or specifically if you have a short, uh, the current can be such high travel, it can be such an extreme amount of current that travels uh, between the capacitor and, you know, out of the inverter to your short, that the output MOSFETs will literally explode before the inverter has time to react you know you're talking about you know a couple thousandths of a second you know if you've got a you know several hundred amp output uh, you know 10, 10 times or something the inverters rating uh, you'll simply blow those output MOSFETs up uh, before before the inverter can react on a 
pure sign low frequency inverter like this one over here MOSFETs are cheap and what they've done on this is they've probably doubled up on the, on the number of MOSFETs that, that would be required the, the only solid state component that would be required to output 6,000 watts anyway the, the, it's, it's like got more MOSFETs in it than it needs it's got more ability to take that DC and change it to AC than is required MOSFETs are cheap they're already in a big giant heavy case. It's no big deal to add a few extra. Uh, that, that AC goes into the transformer, it's 12 volt AC. And the transformer transforms it to, you know, to high voltage. If you've got a very heavy high load, like you're trying to start an air conditioner compressor in a house or something, the transformer doesn't have the, the if you would, the mechanical ability. Like if you if you run it at 18,000 watts, it would eventually heat up and burn up. But it's such a large chunk, it takes a long time to get it hot. But it doesn't have the mechanical ability to move that much power. So if you have an extremely high load, say of 18,000 watts, you'll have a significant voltage sag. That voltage sag, though it sounds like a bad thing, is actually a good thing in an inverter like this because it just allows the voltage to dip down. Uh, the compressor to start up or whatever and we're not talking about going to zero volts but maybe going from you know 120 volts down to 90 or something like that uh, we'll probably give this thing a workout when we get to put it in there we'll actually see what it does but it drops the voltage down significantly causes a voltage sag and that allows whatever you try to start to come up to speed without pulling you know an astronomical you know 100 100 amps or something like that trying to start up an air conditioner compressor and you've got to keep in mind that this is something that probably would happen over, you know, a tenth of a second, you know, just a few cycles when the lock load ramps of a of an inver of an air conditioner compressor, uh, you know, would, would make a few revolutions, start coming up to speed, and, and that current would drop very quickly. You know, a, an inverter like a high frequency would trip instantly, you know, trying to start something like that. There wouldn't be a, you know, there wouldn't be a, you know, trying to start it. It would just click, click, and it would, it would be off. The other big advantage, the other, I want to say main advantage to a, uh, to a low frequency inverter, other than its overload abilities, is the fact that every single component that's used in this inverter to make DC into AC also works great for turning AC into DC. You can charge your, charge your battery with it. You basically supply your high voltage windings with 120 volt AC. Uh, you output here probably 14, 16 volts DC, something like that. When a MOSFET is in the on state, it actually works as a rectifier or a diode. And so you can use all these diodes that you can turn off and on. Something screwed up with my air conditioner. Uh, you can take all these diodes that you turn off and on and rectify that low voltage uh, AC back to your charger and if you've got a little charge controller like this has built in somewhere in this board that uh, that allows you to control your voltages and turn you know turn the MOSFETs off and on or off and on at a certain part of the sine wave or something to uh, to control your, your battery charge uh, you know very precisely I guess I'm gonna have to put this thing back together there's a little, a little control things on the front here. You can see the big giant dent that's in this thing. So let's feed some horsepower to this thing. Five and a quarter volts and nothing smoked with no amps. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Inverter on. Nothing. Oh, there it went. There it goes. So I have a hunch. Let's see if this is actually true. 
The, you know, as, as I talked about, uh, the input to the side of this transformer, the primary of the transformer, uh, the little voltage spikes will be equal to the input voltage. And so I bet that if we turn the voltage up higher than 25 volts, we'll get it up, I think this goes up to 30 volts, it'll probably use a higher no load power. Now it's sitting here running right now, it's 2.7 amps, uh, 68 watts, 69 watts. Uh, let's turn the voltage up and see if the if the static power consumption goes up. Well, significantly, it's up to 90, 98 watts at 31 volts. That's how high as it goes, 31 volts. I expect it to be a little bit. That's that's a lot. Let's turn it down. Let's get it down to. It's down to 22 volts and it's beeping now, it says low voltage. But it's actually brought the, uh, the no load uh, current or the no load power consumption down to uh, 55 watts. Cut it completely in half. Not, not at all what I expected. You know, probably charging voltage will be about 29 volts, something like that. So it's a uh, 80, 88 watts power consumption, probably charge voltage, and you know, around 20, 24 and a half or so, 65 watts, two two and a half amps. I'll have to look and see what they what they claim the uh, what they claim the um, no load, no load current, the standby power consumption. All right, I hope you can kind of see what's going on here. I know I got the air conditioner blowing right on you. It's probably noisy. I got the thing stuffed in here. It was, uh, it was quite a pain. It's so heavy. I've got the high voltage hooked up. There's a neutral, and and, and the two legs, which normally would be 240 volts, are brought together and brought in the 120 volt side of the uh, the inverter. This is a 120 uh, output only, it's not a 120 to 40. Uh, I've got to hook the, uh, the low voltage up. I've got a couple of four out cables. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can see, if it's not on the video, I'll bring you over and show you, but I've got the, the DC bus right here, the, what am I trying to say, the DC shot. It's going to go to my battery monitor. It's right here, this battery monitor actually works off negative. Uh, it, it, it works off the ground side of the battery, not the positive. So I've got the low voltage cables hooked up to the inverter here. Uh, this here is a little DC shunt that is the shunt for the, uh, I forgot what it's called, a little deal that, cho that shows you how charged your batteries are or how much you're using. It's not hooked up yet, it's going in my, my, my uh, control panel, it's not there, but, but this part of it is. Anyway, these three cables are the three negative cables that go to the batteries. Uh, this is the negative cable that goes to the big alternator that's on the uh, on the generator. And these two wires will go to, there's one, one charger up here, it's just off, off camera I believe. There'll be a set of those. Anyway, I can go ahead and hook the, uh, I think I'll hook the positive up first. So this here is the positive. I don't have a good way, I don't have any kind of terminal block to hook this up with. So I got the little battery charger under there running. It's it's putting out 
uh, 1200 watts into the into the battery bank right now or 50 amps whatever that comes out to be I guess a little bit higher than that because of the uh, the battery charge voltage is higher than 24 volts whatever um, the battery is sort of low because the, the control circuitry uh, for the air conditioners and some other stuff were sitting on the PLC were actually running off the batteries in the last few weeks and I didn't consider that <laughs> and now the batteries are about half dead Anyway, hopefully there's enough power in here that we can sort of get a good test on this. For the lack of a better way of putting it, I'm going to do what I can to frack this thing. I want to see if it has a weak link. I'm going to take it as hard as I can go to literally its breaking point electrically uh, with the batteries, with the wiring, with the inverter, with the high voltage wiring. I'm going to try to run all three air conditioners. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to have all three air conditioners running. I'm going to try to flip from short power to inverter power to see if that inverter can react fast enough to take on, you know, a, 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 a very large load, you know, probably 7,500 watts or more. And then I can turn the water heater on and, uh, I don't know, I can find some electric heaters or something to plug in to, to put more load than that on it. So I've got a breaker right down here I can trip. When I trip it, it'll trip the contactor back to, uh, the, to the inverter side. And let's see what happens. Here we go. <laughs> well, there's your answer. Uh, the back air conditioner is on. It's running. Let's turn on this middle air conditioner. It'll take it a second for the compressor to come on. Let's see what the actual inrush current to this thing is. So if you look behind me here, there is now two inverters. So you kind of saw what happened. I turned the camera off quickly after it didn't work because I was surprised it didn't work. And, uh, and this thing would, would randomly shut off. When I put a load on it, it would go off. Uh, it did actually run the back air conditioner for a couple of minutes, but anytime there was any significant load, uh, it, it would go off and restart. I'm talking about even just the lights and stuff at the end. And, uh, and it would always come back on, but but after 10 or 15 or 20 seconds, less time the more the load, uh, it would just go off and recycle anyway. I think it's probably something in the control circuitry. It might have been a software issue with it. Is, is probably my feeling. Uh, it's an old gun. Like I said, it was it was dated 18 in 2018. I think it was probably something that they had trouble with and was sent back to the factory or, or, or you know, who knows what. And then it just wasn't fixed. You know, if you hook it up to a power supply, like we did the shop, it, it run, starts up and runs. It looks like it's going to work. But when you put a load on it, uh, you know, any load at all, you know, just a few hundred watts, uh, it, it, it trips off after a few minutes. Now, uh, these thing, this thing back here is hooked up and running. Uh, we're fixed to, uh, for lack of a better word, as I said, I think what I said, I'm gonna frack it, uh, see what blows up. Uh, we'd like, I'd like to put a load on it, make sure we're not gonna have any problems. If we're gonna have any problems, I wanna know right now. Anyway, the, the log rotor current on these air conditioners, uh, these, these, let me back up. These two, uh, what do you call them? Uh, transfer switches that I've got seem to have a small amount of, of delay between when one contact opens and the other one closes. Enough for the air conditioners to stop because when I've got the generator running, you know, the generator will easily make a couple hundred amps. Um, when, you, when you switch from generator to uh, shoreline power or vice versa, it, uh, it, it stays off. Now the lights just blink, but it stays off long enough that the compressor stop and then the compressors, uh, you know, actually trip off on the thermal overload that's inside the compressors. And so anyway, I expect something like that to happen here, but with all these three of these being, you know, a lock rotor state, the lock rotor current's probably, you know, 60 amps or 60 or 80 amps or something on, on these air conditioners. Uh, we should be able to have an absolute maximum output current reading of what this uh, power converter will put out. Anyway, I got an amp meter, clamp amp meter, uh, that will uh, that'll keep up with uh, 
it's maximum inrush current, it reads inrush current. And so we'll actually be able to see if the air conditioners don't start what the what the absolute maximum uh, power output of this uh, power inverter is. So I'm gonna go put the clamp meter on and then we'll uh, we'll uh, flip over, flip the breaker. Alright, here we go. set on the 100 amp scale and it said overload so it pulled more than 100 amps through that through, that, uh, uh, through the inverter. Let's do it again. It read 95 amps that time. I, I'm really I'm really really shocked that it will start these air conditioners like that. So we've got all three air conditioners running. Our DC current here is 275 amps. Our AC current is uh, 48, so that's pretty much six, it's running at 6,000 watts right now. Let's see, uh, let me turn the hot water heater on. Oh, now it's dropping. All right, this got us up to 60, 65 amps. Somebody, somebody do the math real quick on that. Uh, that's pulling 421 amps uh, DC. Check the voltage. Input voltage is 22.7 volts. I've got to have all my hands here. And that be it. It said that was too much. <laughs> seem to be about what the rating of the inverter is, about 50 amps, about 6,000 watts. I didn't really expect to run three air conditioners off the power inverter. There's just not really enough DC capacity or ability to get DC that, that high amount to the inverter long term. Uh, it absolutely will work in a situation where you say you're coming into an RV park and you want to shut your generator down you know, and running for 20 or 30 minutes or something like that while you get hooked up and plugged in. Uh, absolutely it'll handle that. Um, and absolutely it'll handle, you know, my idea behind the inverter was you could run air conditioner in front, air conditioner in the back, and, and a microwave and the water pump and something else. And even if that inverter is slightly overloaded, you know, kind of on and off as things come and go, uh, it, it would handle that. But, but I didn't really think of it as being a, an actual 6,000 watt power supply. But uh, I am super, super pleased with this thing. It's got a ton of grunt, you know. You, I, I don't know if I actually show you the, you know, the, the, the switch over current was, what did I say, is it 95 or 97 amps? You know, the first time it was higher than that because it, it overloaded at 100 amps, it was above 100 amps. I mean, it output 100 amps, that's 12,000 watts, 12 kilowatts of power. It takes a pretty significant generator to be able to do that. And, and we didn't get anything but just a slight blink in the lights, you know, just a, just a shimmer uh, as, as, as it dumped that big load on your lawn. Anyway, I'm psyched, I'm super pleased. I hate that one of them blew up or that I was sent a junk one. Uh, you know, but I was, Amazon took care of me, I can't, I can't complain about that. 
And uh, I'm going to let it run here for 30, 45 minutes. I'm going to take this in the house. I'm going to go back out here and see if anything's smoking, basically. Um, this thing's been running like an hour and 20, an hour and 24 minutes. Um, I know y'all didn't see, haven't seen the battery bank install. It's right under my feet right here. That's probably coming out in the next video. I actually did it a couple weeks ago, actually before we weighed it, uh, before I weighed it the first time, or before we drove it. Uh, but anyway, the inverter back there is pulling about, well, my hand went off. It's, it's pulling about 165 amps. Uh, running two air conditioners, the back air conditioner and the, and, the, and the middle one. The battery bank has got a usable capacity of about 500 amp hours, so 500 divided by 165, 170 is about three hours. That's exactly what I was shooting for. I wanted to be able to park this thing, uh, leave the dogs in the front, not have to run the generator, and be able to go in and go eat, go to a museum, go, go do something, you know, whatever. And uh, and it still be cool and still have, you know, the dogs still be fine uh, when we get back. So anyway, I, I want to back up for some of y'all that are kind of new. I, my generator is, is, is a 100 horse Detroit. Uh, it's got an air compressor made on it. You know, it builds air through the coach when you start it. And it's got two speeds. It's got a, I think it was a 20, 28 kilowatt generator head on it. Anyway, 1800 RPMs, uh, it makes, you know, effectively unlimited amount of power for a, for a motorhome. You know, 20, 25, or it might have been a 30 kilowatt, I've forgotten now. It, it was, I do some math, I don't remember. Anyway, because it was, it's a three-phase generator and I wired it double delta, so you got to do some math to figure out what the actual uh, KVA output of it would be. But anyway, um, if you need unlimited power, so to speak, you take the generator to high speed, to gen mode. Uh, when you just start the generator, the generator idles and it's got a 270 amp, 24 volt DC alternator uh, that's belt driven that is there to recharge this battery bank or to use basically as an inverter generator. You know, the generator sits there and idles and, uh, and you, you know, the, makes power and the inverter inverts it back to, to 120. But anyway, uh, you know, I've only got three hours of battery time, but if I start that generator, I've got effectively unlimited amount of battery time was the point I'm trying to get at. Even though we're not really running off the battery, we're running off the alternator or the generator, but you can have the generator idle. It doesn't have to be running wide open or be wound up. Um, you know, sort of like two sizes of a generator made into one. You know, effectively working like an inverted generator. You know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do exactly the same thing, but the same idea. But anyway, I wanted to add, I'm going to at some point, probably not like right now, but some point down the road, I want to add an alternator to the truck engine, probably like 100 amp, 24 volts. Uh, it would put 100 amps into this battery bank. So anyway, if you had 100 amps going into the battery bank and you got two air conditioners running, you're pulling 160 out, you know, that would give you like eight or nine hours of runtime uh, before you would have to recharge your batteries. And so my thinking of this is, is you're driving from, from one RV park to another uh, with a truck running and two air conditioners, you would probably have enough battery power to get you to the new, next RV park. Of course, when you plug in, you know, it's gonna charge everything back up and you could actually make your day trip without having to run the generator. And then of course, obviously you could start it up and run it uh, for an, the generator for an hour or two uh, to you know charge your battery back up if you sort of sort of start to run on the battery. Um, you know you saw it run three air conditioners uh, and, it, and it absolutely did. Uh, that was about its maximum limitation. I think most of the time if you're going to run three air conditioners you need to simply kick the generator up to high speed. Uh, however if you're going to run two and the water heater and have something like a you know a, a griddle or something kick off and on. I think that it has the ability to, to produce over 6,000 watts uh, for several minutes. I think it was like 125 percent for 20 minutes, maybe. I, I had to look. I don't remember. But anyway, you know that's exactly what I wanted. I got what I wanted. I, I know I've said that several times, uh, but you know I run two air conditioners. Uh, obviously, you know, the back air conditioner, if you just run one, they'll give it six hours of run time. Uh, if you're going to spend the night somewhere and it's cool, the air conditioner is not going to run six hours continuously. Uh, you know, that's not elapsed time. That's, 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 
operating time for the air conditioner. And so you'll easily be able to spend the night somewhere and not have to run the generator. And then you can run the generator during the day for a few hours to charge the batteries up. It should take about two hours to charge the batteries uh, off the generator if, you, if you're not running anything else. And if you are running something else, you can simply kick the generator up to gen mode, uh, run the load off the generator, and use the alternator to only charge the battery bank. Uh, what else? I kind of felt around. There was really nothing more. The batteries, the battery cables were kind of hot. I was sort of surprised, I hate to say displeased, though that's probably the correct, correct thing to say. Uh, I was displeased with the amount of heat that, that, uh, that the uh, inverter rejects. Uh, it feels like a 1500 watt electric heater blowing heat out of it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely humping it and getting it. But, uh, you know, they're not real efficient. Uh, you got a big, big transformer in there that's pulling a bunch of current through it. Uh, you know, we kind of expected that. You, you, you trade off the efficiency for uh, overload capabilities, basically. What else? Is that about it? Um, I guess that about sums it up. I feel like this has been sort of like a wide open video and I'm fixing this hit a wall. I don't know what to say next. It's like, stop! <laughs> That, that inverter does have a charge function. Uh, the charge function is not going to be hooked up or used. Um, I, I've said this before, I'm gonna say it one more time. When you flip the, the inverter, the flip the contactor to make the inverter take over the load of the, of the coach, there's still this other breaker box that's got two breakers that's going to run two battery chargers. And so while you're running the coach off the, off the uh, inverter, you can actually plug the short cord in, say the 15 amp plug, and you can pull 1200 watts or a 30 amp plug, you pull 2400 watts. You know, that's not the mathematical limitation of the plug, but that's the limitation of my chargers uh, through the cord. So if you want to go somewhere uh, where you don't need a lot of air conditioning, but you want to be able to do something like, you know, have two air conditioner cycles simultaneously, run electric hot water heater and a griddle, you can run all that off the inverter and then have that little 15 amp plug just keep your battery bank topped off. I guess that's it. I want to close this video out. I uh, appreciate you watching. You know, I've had uh, I've had a couple of people comment, you know, they say, hey, you know, we really like your channel. I don't know why it gets, doesn't get more views or whatever, more subscribers. I, uh, I don't set this up to be monetized. I don't make any money off of it. I, it wasn't my plan. I don't care about that. I make my living in the oil field. I mean, I suppose any, any passive income is good, but that's just not, not the reason I'm here. Uh, there's some companies that help promote YouTube videos. I'm not gonna spend any money on it. If, if y'all who watch wanna promote this, it takes y'all. You know, I, I can share it to Instagram and to, you know, my Facebook account, but a few hundred of y'all sharing it to your Facebook or your Instagram or I, I don't I don't do a lot of social media. I'm gonna let myself sound like an idiot. But you know, it takes y'all. If if you want the if you want the video to go, it's gonna take y'all. I'm, I'm just not gonna pay uh, pay some promoter to do it for me and I don't have time. You know, if if it was a if it was in my head set up to be something I want to try to make a living at, uh, you know, I would structure things differently. I would probably have better equipment, I would work harder on the videos. I, I do these videos sort of in a, uh, I don't know if redneck style is the correct way to put it, but you know, they're not a big production. I don't I don't go out of my way to make things look really nice and cool. I just like to have good information. I like to not have a bunch of blank spots, you know, they got a bunch of fast forwarding in them, but I, I, I try to make my videos like the videos I like to watch. And there's several guys I like, you know, they don't necessarily have a bunch of background music, uh, but they're smart and they know what they're talking about. They got good information. Anyway, that's my spill. If you want it to go, it's going to be up to y'all because I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care. <laughs> anyway, I'm done rambling. I appreciate you watching. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, I will catch you on the next one.